Thank you, everyone. Can you hear me? All right. Um, good morning. Welcome to CrunchConf. Um, I'm glad to see that so many of you are interested in ruining your business. Uh, so let's not tell your boss that you're here. Um, so yeah, I come from a background of data scientist, but also currently I'm running uh, the engineering teams at uh, RapidMiner. And also I'm leading the internal data science efforts. So I have various perspectives on how people can ruin their business on data science. Um, we see a lot of our users and customers doing not so reasonable things um, with data science and potentially impacting the business in a negative way. And also, sometimes we commit our own mistakes and own um, problems we, we have. So I have multiple perspectives on what can go wrong in a data science project. But before we talk about the bad parts, uh, let me touch on the good ones. So we see a lot of great examples on how companies can do great things with machine learning and data science and how can they become successful. So one interesting example is Amazon. They are on track to become the first trillion dollar company uh, on earth. Um, and some say that some of their success, some even quantify that 20% of their success or 20% of their sales comes from the use of machine learning models comes from the use of making recommendations and making sure that uh, people get customized content. So that's quite, quite an impressive number that they, they have such a big impact on their huge business with data science and machine learning. Another great example is Google. So everyone probably knows that much of Google's revenue comes from ads. Um, and behind those ad serving systems, there are a lot of machine learning, a lot of tuning going on. So we could say that probably 90% of Google's revenue relies on some type of machine learning. Um, so these are great examples, but obviously, if you're an online company, it's way easier to collect the data and make sure that you base your decisions on data. Um, but there are great examples in other areas like Tesco, a retail company, which is a completely offline business, or at least it used to be for a very long time. They have been pioneers in using data as a strategic asset. They even had a separate company making sure that their data is used in the best way and they could sell their data uh, and that's how they managed to increase uh, much of their productivity. On the other hand, if you are reading the news, Tesco is not doing great these days and uh, also, although I would not contribute that fully to data science and machine learning, uh, some of it is. There's a great article at Datanami um, which describes what they did and how it went so wrong. Uh, and one of the things is that they kind of used data science just for their own interest and they didn't really give uh, anything back to the, to the customers, to the users. Um, so one great example, my wife has obviously a Tesco loyalty card and whenever she receives some new coupons, she's like very excited. Look how lucky we are that now they are giving us diapers and we have discount on diapers. And I'm like, well, you know, that's not really luck. They are kind of abusing the data that you provided about yourself and they, they know that you will then come back to buy those diapers. Um, so yeah, it's, there's always a trade-off of how ethical you, you do with data science and machine learning. And for example, in the case of Tesco, many of their customers were very pissed off when they learned some of the practices that Tesco has been using. So. Yeah, there are many different ways to succeed with machine learning and, and data science. So just to kind of introduce you to some of the pitfalls and some of the challenges, um, I figured what would be the best example to, uh, to use initially. And um, it was so obvious afterwards that we should be analyzing aliens. Let's analyze some aliens. And it's not a joke, there is a great data set about 80,000 UFO sightings in the United States. So full disclosure, uh, even though, as probably most of you, I'm very skeptical about, about these sightings, but full disclosure, one of my family relatives is part of the Hungarian UFO Society. So let's try to approach this with professionalism and uh, let's act like a data scientist being hired by the UFO Society and let's try to make meaningful conclusions based on this data, assuming that they are here, they are with us, and um, what are the interesting patterns that they show um, what we can learn from those sightings. 
So actually, if you want to, please check this data set. Um, there are quite amazing descriptions uh, of some of these sightings. So let's do some basic data analysis. So some distributions. When did those sightings happen? Um, if you look at the chart, you can see pretty much an inflection point in 1993. So anyone has a guess what happened in 1993? That's right. That was the premiere of the TV show called X-Files. Um, so, yeah, as a serious data scientist, we should make our conclusions based on this data. So it must mean that aliens are fans of the X-Files. So they are coming to watch the show. I mean, if there would be a, a, a TV series about data scientists, I would totally watch it, right? So aliens must be coming to watch the X-Files as well. All right, let's look into when they come in the, as and part of the week. So here you can see the orange color means more activity, more UFO sightings. Uh, the blue means basically zero. Um, so it seems they show up typically during the evenings, during the night, and they are especially very active on Saturdays. So um, how can that be? It's very clear. Uh, UFOs, aliens, work hard and party hard. They are very social beings. They go out with us on Saturday nights. Uh, they like to drink and, um, you know, engage with humans. Um, I mean, I don't understand why we, figured, why we haven't figured this out earlier. Um, let's use another one. So based on, if you aggregate it for the week, which week they really showed up, which, when do, did those uh, sightings happen? Obviously, there is this fluctuation during the week, so Saturdays are more active, but if you just look at the weekly uh, patterns, July 4th, the week of July 4th, it really stands out. So uh, those of you who don't know, July 4th is Independence Day in the US. So, conclusions? Aliens love America. It's great, it's so obvious, and there is also a peak uh, during New Year's Eve, so they must love fireworks too. Um, so this introduction is really just supposed to um, highlight that if you come with a bias, come with your assumptions of how things are, the very same data can show very different things and you can interpret it in various ways. Um, so as someone coming um, from the UFO society, I assume that these things are correct. There, I mean, in the data we do not see anything which would invalidate my points on aliens loving America, right? So all these examples and all the, um, so all these examples, um, this, uh, this example I just used to kind of have an introduction on some of the more serious topics. So I promise no more aliens today, sorry. Um, so some of the more serious topics, some of the topics I would like to cover, like three main ones. Uh, one which was already kind of introdu introduced, this confusion between correlation and causation. So we are always trying to tell a story about our data, but we are never telling the story that X is correlated with Y. We are always telling a story, this happened because of that. So we are already implying a causation, and that may or may not be there. Um, the second one, which is a big one, there are so many ways to do it wrong. So basically wrong model validation. You have some predictive model and um, you are not doing the exactly right things from the statistical perspective. Um, and the last one is focusing on models versus the data and the data preparation. We will get there as well. So let's start with the correlation and causation topic. So it's a more serious example than, than the aliens but there, is, there are lots of studies uh, telling you that the more books, if the more books are available at home, the student will have better grades. So there's clear correlation with, in the, between the test marks and the number of books at home. So there was this great uh, governor in the US, in Illinois. The clicker does not seem to work. All right, let me tell the story while we try to figure that out. Ah, okay, I have it. So there was this great governor, Rod Blagojevich, uh, governor of Illinois, who figured out that it would be a great idea to, to mail a book 
uh, to every kid. So then they would have books at home, so obviously then they would have better grades at school. If you think about it, this would cost like 26 million a year, like 20 years from now when those people grow up and go to the job market, they would be more qualified, they would get better job, they would pay more, so obviously they would pay more taxes. So it's a really good investment to just send some free books to those children and then they will pay more taxes down the road. However, another study showed that while this is still true, there are lots of studies confirming the correlation that if there are more books, then there are better test marks. But some studies asked for one more question. Did you actually read the books or not? Turns out it doesn't really matter. So it, what matters is you have the books. But if you read it or not, you have the same test marks. So that kind of invalidates uh, the hypothesis by Mr. Blagojevic that um, sending books to those families and to those children will do anything. Um, so obviously we could then come up with another hypothesis that families who think that learning is important typically have books. So probably that's the underlying reason why those uh, students are showing better test marks, um, that their families are more supportive in their learning. But I would like to really highlight one point regarding this, what Mr. Blagojevic was saying and what I am saying, those are all just hypotheses. The difference is that his hypothesis is, was proven wrong. Mine wasn't yet. Um, but this, those are all just hypotheses. Um, turns out actually that Mr. Blagojevic has had various wrong decisions down the road. So at this point, he is in federal prison for uh, bribing. Um, but it doesn't mean that my hypothesis would be better. I'm not in prison. I hope I won't ever be. Um, but it doesn't mean that my hypoth hypothesis is any better. And to support that point, there is something called a bias blind spot. So I come with my own bias, and that's how I explain this correlation. Um, but it turns out if you ask people how biased they think you, they are, 85% will say that I'm less biased than average. Let me tell you something, exactly 50% of you are less biased than average. Um, so clearly we are overestimating how unbiased we are. Um, actually in this study they showed that 14, additional 14% said that they are average biased. And only 1% of, of the people asked said I'm more biased than average. I mean that just cannot be true. We all believe that we are less biased. Uh, so we have our own assumptions and that's how we build our own world, build our own bubble. Uh, but at the end of the day, um, your hypothesis or my hypothesis, we need to prove one of them. Uh, otherwise, we cannot decide which one is true. So in this case, one of those hypotheses was invalidated and, made, and confirmed not to be true. But um, the only, that's, that's unfortunate with all machine learning and data science. The only clear way to say that you have causation and not just correlation between these things is to do A-B testing. Many of you may know A-B testing. There will be a couple of talks about A-B testing at this conference. Um, so I would like to warn everyone that whenever you are interpreting your data, interpreting your models, if it's not relying on A-B testing, you are really just looking at correlations. And you are fabricating a story around it which may or may not be true, and you may, may very well be very biased, even without realizing it. So let's look into some specific example on how this may show up in a data science exercise. So here is a, a data set, just the first few records of the Titanic accident. So you, you have like uh, 1,400 passengers that, you, that were on the Titanic. You have a bunch of attributes about them and you obviously know who survived and who didn't survive. So let's try this experiment. Let's try to predict how ma what are the rules that drive if people survive or not. So let's build a predictive model to say, if I would be boarding Titanic 2, uh, what would be my chances? So I could build a model and that can tell me uh, if I would survive in case of an accident or not. So I will use some of these uh, diagrams. So all these uh, diagrams, they come from RapidMiner. They represent one step in your analytics process. This is pretty much just for illustrative purposes so you understand what the analytic steps have been. So just loading the data, doing cross-validation. We will talk about cross-validation in a moment. 
but for now it's a method to um, estimate the accuracy of your model. And inside that cross-validation we are using a gradient boosted tree, quite a, a good model typically, um, but it's not something that is very easy to interpret. So a model comes out, it will tell you how accurate it is, but it's a bunch of decision trees, it's very hard to interpret what the important things are and what the rules are uh, in that model. So it turns out that we can predict this outcome if someone survived or not with 97% accuracy. That's amazing. Maybe a little too amazing, right? So it's unlikely that we could be able to, to predict that outcome so well. Um, so if you look at the data, you may suspect that there are things in the data which are not supposed to be there. So for example, if you look at the last column, there's a column saying lifeboat that actually tells you which lifeboat that person uh, was traveling in after the accident. Obviously, if it's none, then that person didn't make it to any of the lifeboats, so they had a very high chance of not surviving. Um, even though your data looked completely sensible, uh, you didn't exclude this attribute uh, from your data set and you ended up with a great model. So you are running to your boss and presenting, hey, I can predict this very well. No, you can't. If there would be another uh, case when you would need to do this prediction, that attribute would not be in your data set. Right? So if you're, anytime if you're looking for, looking into these results, if the results are too good, you should always be skeptical and suspicious on what might be going, going on. And um, probably a good best practice to do is every time you start modeling, check for highly correlated attributes. If one of your attributes is very correlated with your target variable, it's very likely that you won't have that attribute at the time of prediction uh, at any given point in time. Another great example is um, I have, um, is a company which is typically doing, uh, you know, calling up people over the phone and trying to sell something. So they have a huge database of people, they have all kinds of historical statistics on what they did and some demographics and so on. So at one point they created uh, an affinity model. How likely is this person to buy from us if we call them for th with this specific offer? Um, and so they created a data set from historical data. We called these people, they said yes. We called those people, they said no. Um, and there was another attribute at the very end on how long did we c talk to these people? So how many minutes we have spent with these people over the phone? Turns out that this attribute is very, very predictive if they will buy or not. Of course, because if they will buy, they will need to share all kinds of data, where to ship it, uh, all kinds of personal data. So you spend like five minutes with that person over the phone to be able to sell that thing. If they say no, they will tell it to you in 10 seconds and you are off the phone. Uh, so you have been using an attribute again, which is not available at the time of prediction. Um, and you cannot really base future um, predictions or future models on that. So kind of a summary on this correlation and causation topics. I think it's very deep, so we could go on and, and talk about other things as well. Uh, but basically checking if some of your attributes are highly correlated with what you try to predict is, is a good practice. Also between those attributes, if there are very strange patterns, you really need to understand where they, where they are coming from. Do they come from wrong data collection? Do they come from the fact that those attributes are generated after the event happened that you're trying to predict? Um, so you need to really understand the domain a bit on, on what those things are. And if you can, if you are in an environment that allows you to do that, then do A-B testing, or at least monitor your models and make sure that they are sensible. So then on to the next bigger topic. Um, there are so, so, so many ways to, to do this wrong. So I will bring like two or three examples on how you can make mistakes in model validation. So one of the key ones, and yeah, still many people commit that. So let's say you have a training set. We are loading random data. So what do we expect? How well can we predict that? Probably pretty much at random. So we have a target attribute like yes and no. We have a chance of predicting that for 50%. So if anybody builds a model that can predict random then better than that, uh, then probably you have a problem in your, in your model. So we're just training a model, in this case the K nearest neighbors, applying that model on the very same data set. So we are calculating the training error. 
and calculating the performance. So what will be the training error? Zero percent. We have a perfect prediction on the training data set. Of course, because if you know the model of k nearest neighbors, what it does is when you need to predict something, it looks in the training data set, what is the closest item I have to this, to this data point? Obviously, that actual data point is in your training data set, you know, you, so you know the answer, what your prediction should be. Um, if you do it properly with cross-validation, then you get the proper 50% chance of figuring out if it's yes or no. Um, and a few words about cross-validation, then in this case, it's a four-fold cross-validation, which means uh, you are doing four iterations, and every given time you are taking 75% um, of your data set as a training set, and the remaining 25 as a test set. So you make sure that always your training set and test set are unique, so they do not have any overlapping data points, so you cannot possibly um, see any future things that you need to predict. And then you just move that 25% to various places in your data set. So you have four iterations. You're using uh, all data points for training three times, and you're all using all data points for testing once. So it's pretty good for predicting the outcome uh, or uh, calculating the accuracy of the model. Uh, in most cases, I would highly recommend everyone to use cross-validation to validate the models. Never look at the training errors. It's really misleading. If you are an expert and you have been in data science and machine learning for a decade, then yeah, sure, there are cases when you can figure out things from the training error. But as someone starting in this field, you, you should never look into training errors because they are just misleading. They can show you completely irrelevant trends and can be very optimistic. So here is another one that I, I like. Um, so let's have some data set again, uh, a random data set. And I mean, we don't know which model will describe it best. It's typical. You have so many models. You have deep learning. You have gradient-boosted trees. You have random forests. You can narrow nets. You have all kinds of models, uh, all good and all great for certain use cases, but you just don't know which one will work best for you. Also, many of these models have lots of parameters, so you can optimize those parameters and try to figure out if I tune them a bit, maybe I can get a better result. So you try different variations of those parameters. So that's what happens here. You are doing a parameter optimization on top, and inside that, you are properly validating with your model with cross-validation. Okay, great. So let's say this is an, an area. So let's say it's not random data. This is an area where collecting data is highly expensive. So let's think about things like healthcare, so you do not possibly have millions of records about um, disease outcomes or, or something like that, so like drug testing or things like that. You typically have a few hundred, maybe a few thousand test cases. So there are great areas where machine lear learning can flourish, like where Google and, and Facebook, they have lots of data, but in certain domains, it's just not reality. You only have a, a small set of data to, to build your models. So let's say we have 100 records. Um, it's a healthcare example, and you're predicting the outcome, yes or no, whatever that exact problem is. So let me use a model. I won't tell you which model it is, um, but I'm just trying to optimize its parameters. It's a black box for now, but it has three parameters. Uh, it has some numeric parameter, where we can say it's 0 0.1, 2, 5, or 1, or 2. So like five possible values that I'm trying to optimize and figure out which one is the best. Um, then I have parameter two and three, which are Booleans, yes or no, true or false. Um, so these are the parameters of the model. It's pretty typical that some of these complex models have like tens or dozens of parameters. Um, so here, let's say that this parameter combination of, of the bold values, like parameter one at, at one, parameter two was yes, and parameter three was no, we have the outcome of 62% accuracy. We have properly validated our models. It's cross-validation inside. So it's, it's a fair result. It's really what it is. We haven't used information from the future. It's all good. So let me share what this model is. I just gave it a name, considering trademarking it. It's Zoltan with a coin. 
so which euro coin I use for my model. So I can toss a coin of a 10 cent euro coin, a 20 cent, a 50 cent, or a 1 euro or 2 euros. Am I doing it with right hand or left hand? And the third parameter is am I wearing glasses or not? So clearly this model is highly random, I would say. And uh, optimizing through 20 of these models, so 5 times 2 times 2 combinations of these parameter values, so 20 combinations, still one of those random models resulted in a 62% accuracy. That's amazing, but I highly doubt that this great model, Zoltan with a coin, will perform at 62% in any future data set. Um, and I would say many, many people um, make this mistake. Um, obviously, not all models are so random than as Zoltan with a coin. Um, but there we have models like random forest, obviously with some intrinsic randomness. We have deep learning, neural nets. Um, they have uh, lots of randomness inside. They change outcomes, change the model structure if you feed them data in, in different order, for example. So there are a fair amount of randomness in those models. So if you just run a bunch of parameter optimization on those models and you're not backtesting your optimization afterwards, you will end up with a highly optimistic uh, value. So lots of randomness adds up and if you're selecting the best out of those, that randomness, you're obviously way too optimistic on the outcome. So I have seen users of ours, uh, customers of ours doing parameter optimization on millions of potential combinations of parameters um, in, on very small data sets. Um, and they are then obviously overestimating the impact they can have on their business. So one final one which is, which looks like a very minor thing, uh, but some of these minor things can add up. Um, so in this case, it seems we are doing it all right again. We are loading some data, just normalizing it because it's um, the different attributes in this data have very different uh, scales. So normalization looks like a reasonable thing to do. And then within the cross validation, we are doing some modeling. Turns out that if you use this more normalization outside of the cross validation, you are overly optimistic by about 1%. So this problem you can predict for 90%. If you are doing this normalization before, you end up with 91%. But that extra 1% is not real. Uh, because what happens here is that you're normalizing on all your data. So you are using information which includes all the data set, including the training set and the test set. So you are kind of leaking information into the test phase by, by doing such pre-processing step early on. Um, so let me show you how it's properly done, how you should be doing. You have a training phase and you have a testing phase. Uh, and in the testing phase, in the training phase, you shouldn't use any data which is not in your training set. So you should only do the normalization, only figure out how to normalize your data on the 90% or 75% or whatever the size of the training set is. You should never use any information from the test set because then you start leaking information back. And maybe it's just 1% for normalization, another percent for other methods like PCA. Um, there could be uh, various things. You are creating new attributes which include like averages from the whole data, data set. You are, every one of those steps you are leaking information about the training data and hence having more optimistic expectations on the model performance. So this is the right way to do it. Always do these, any pre-processing step that requires all the data, so goes through all the records and using multiple rows uh, as the input every one of those should happen in the training phase on a subset on the training set and you should then just apply those same pre-processing steps in the training side or on the testing side sorry so this looks like very small uh, obviously there are bigger capital mistakes you can make uh, there are small mistakes you can do um, but in all cases okay we got it so maybe we are overly optimistic on the outcome how can this really ruin my business um, and this is kind of a fabricated example, but it's very close to something we have seen um, firsthand, actually. So let's say that your company is losing $20 million on churn. So there, you have lots of users who do not renew their subscription and they go to some competitor. Uh, so 20 million is a big number, so we 
do have the expectation that we heard about churn analysis, so we know that data science may help and reduce this number. So let's say that we created a model, and maybe too optimistic validation, we have validated or estimated how good it will be, and we have the, the estimate that we will save 4 million. So we will not be losing 20 million anymore, we will only be losing 16 million of existing customers. Okay, um, to act on it, so to say, for these people where we see they can be saved, we are spending $2 million with custom discounts or some special offers so we can really save them. So it costs us $2 million to do that campaign and we are expected to save $4 million. But it turns out that our expectation, our prediction on how the good the model is was overly optimistic. It's not 20% that we can save, it's really just 5%. So we end up making one million on two million, which is a loss of a million. I would not be that data scientist who, would, um, who did that, um, because obviously you are very quickly out of the job if you lost a million. So kind of summarizing this validation uh, topic, you should completely ignore training errors. Um, like the one I started with, the example I started with. Always use cross-validation if you have some very special data set like time series. There may, you may need some special types of validation techniques like sliding window validation. Um, but typically cross-validation is a good uh, candidate to start with. And all of the transformations that you have on the data which require multiple rows, uh, you should always do it within the training phase and then just apply them in the test phase to make sure that you're not leaking any information from the test set to the training set. And if you are doing optimization, please hold some subset of the data to backtest it if it's really that good, uh, or you can do an outer cross-validation. There can be other techniques, but if you're trying millions of things, just randomness will give you uh, a good result from, from those millions of, of options. And obviously, again, you should not use information which is not available at the time of prediction. Okay, so let's turn to the last one. I think many of us have seen this, and I have to admit, I've been there, I've did these mistakes of focusing too much on modeling instead of focusing on the data and understanding the data. So this is what typically happens. There's a huge hype, hey, machine learning is cool, everyone should do machine learning. We have the citizen data scientists and um, they will do all kinds of things. Um, so they receive the data, they do not even look into it, just look for some fancy model they just heard about, ah, deep learning. Deep learning is cool, let me try that. So they just mindlessly plug in the latest deep learning algorithm. Um, they have the outcome. It is predicting the future in 80% of the cases. That's great, but why? You go to present to management and then, okay, then why is that? How should we trust that? Did you properly validate that? So it's unclear uh, what is in the data. So let me bring one example why you should really start looking into it. Um, this is an example on uh, like a retail company, um, or sorry, real estate company. So you should decide if, sh if you should buy a, a, some, some building or not. Let's say you have some data on those buildings. You have the lengths and the widths of the floor plan, and you have the price of the building, how much you should pay for buying that. Most people, most people starting with data science and machine learning, would look, like, look there and, okay, so we have two yeses, is it the length which is driving it? Uh, no, we have a length of, of 100 and still saying no. Is it the width? No, we also have a width of 100 and saying no. Is it the price? No, we cannot really separate that on price either. Okay, so then it's a complex problem. Let's use deep learning. Or you could just go there and try to understand what this data is. Okay, so this is about real estate. What do these domain experts in real estate do? Well, they typically calculate the area of the building. That's quite a useful number to have. And then if they have the area, they may divide that, divide that with the price. So maybe they want to look, something like, look into something like price per square meter. Wow, that's quite an interesting number and it completely predicts what we should do. Um, so I claim that no deep learning will tell you that if you just have that understanding of the domain. And it's a very simplistic example but in many cases, data scientists are going into areas where they have absolutely no clue about the domain. I mean, I spent six months in my life trying to understand neuroscience. 
I barely succeeded to understand 1% of it. Um, and there's a lot of need to understand that domain to really be able to create useful features, to be able to understand what the underlying reasons may be um, and build better models. So yeah, after some feature engineering, very simplistic ones, we can have perfect predictions with very old school, very boring models like decision trees and linear regression. So it's really not about the hype, not about deep learning everywhere. It's about common sense, I would say. All right. Um, so I think it's, it's a common mistake. Uh, I encourage everyone to try to dig deeper into the data, do more of the data understanding part and understand what's at hand. Um, and probably to do that, it's best to define what you want to achieve, what you want to do. Um, and understand the domain, work with subject matter experts, stakeholders, what their expectations are, and just use common sense. I mean, building those features is it's not too hard. Once you understand what they mean, what, what your original features mean, creating new features and try to understand what might be driving your target variable is, is, uh, is a good practice. And Occam's razor, simple models are simply more robust. So even though if deep learning would be able to have a great uh, predictive power on this data set, I still wouldn't trust it that much because such complexity is in the model. On the other hand, which are, with a very simplistic rule, we can still make our decision. So any, always go for the simpler model. Uh, that's basically what Occam's razor is. All right, key takeaways then, check for correlations before modeling, always. Uh, check if you have any attribute which is not really um, available at prediction time. Um, always use cross validation or some other types of um, validations which make sense for your specific problem. Um, and prepare your data in the right way. So you shouldn't leak information about the testing set to your training phase. Um, use common sense. I think that's generally a good practice uh, in data science. Just use common sense, whatever makes sense. Even though we are dealing with complex technologies and complex algorithms, we shouldn't just rely on them and let them do everything. I'm not a big believer in automated machine learning. When you have a data set, you magically upload it somewhere and it will just magically tell you what to do. Uh, I think it's not realistic. Um, many companies do believe it is. Um, we don't. And uh, yeah, if you like, you can use RapidMiner for many of this prototyping, uh, but obviously you can do the very same things and follow the best practices with Python or R or many other products. So um, last slide, slide here. Uh, much of the credit regarding this talk goes to Ingo Mirsva, who is my colleague. Uh, he cannot be here today, but he has a great video series on YouTube. Um, kind of educational stuff about data science, explaining algorithms, explaining best practices, and a huge amount of fun and craziness as well. So those are really like five, seven minute uh, videos. I highly recommend them. They have a lot of interesting things in there. So yeah, thank you for your time. Thank you, Sultan. That was excellent. Uh, we have a little gift for you for coming to Crunch. Oh, wow. Um, we wanted to thank you for that. Thanks. Uh, so we'll take a minute to do some questions. I'll just pull up uh, Slido. And good. We had one question up until about two minutes ago. So thank you guys for, for bringing those up. Uh, so the first one, how to avoid the parameter optimization pitfalls? I would say that if your data set is larger, you can just set aside a training set, a kind of a holdout set that you are only testing with after you did all the parameter optimization. Or even better, you could even do a cross-validation outside of it. So it gets very complicated and very nested. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, that's the proper way to estimate the, the impact of the model. Um, so it's not easy, and especially if you have 100 records, it's hard to say, yeah, I put aside 10 to do some later on holdout validation. It's not really realistic, so then you need to figure out better ways to do it. But um, yeah, it's more like the statement that if you do this and if you do lots of parameter optimization, whatever result you get, you shouldn't fully trust it. Um, because 
it will be overly optimistic. Cool. Thank you. Next question. How to avoid oops, that's the one I just said. Isn't there a risk that features feature engineering introduces bias in the model? That's a great one. It is. I think it is. Um, you're bringing your own bias with that for sure. Um, on the other end, then you, your model will use it to check for correlations with the target variable. So if your bias, uh, your assumption of why things are is incorrect, then your model will not pick that up and not use a, that as an important variable. So you can create all kinds of attributes like feature engineering and, and do lots of features. Uh, and maybe you will end up a lot of useless ones from the perspective of predicting the outcome. Maybe some of them will be useful and then you can use that in your model. Thank you. This is a good question here also. Um, how would you, this is from Augustine. Sorry, Alex, the, the previous question was from Alex. Augustine asks, how would you convince a manager to believe that a wisely crafted churn prediction is better than a bad one in one minute? <laughs> Come again? <laughs> wisely crafted churn is better than, ah, okay. Yeah, I guess the, I cannot. So if, if a manager haven't really seen any data science before, then probably, um, probably they will go for the bigger number. So if there are two guys, one is saying, I have a better churn model, they will believe and go for that. Um, on the other hand, I think there are enough managers already who have burned themselves with such projects and learned it the hard way that um, whatever a data scientist is saying is not always accurate or not always expected in, in the future uh, predictions. That um, I think it's getting better over time, but it's, it's hard, I realize it's hard. I mean, if someone is just starting off with this space as a manager, yeah. I mean, you are driven by the numbers and you will go for the bigger one. Yeah, I guess that, that, that's a tough question to ask, answer. Uh, do you have more examples of companies, companies projects where data, companies or projects where data science errors really hurt? I guess there are a lot, there are a lot of companies where there have been data science projects which caused quite some losses. Um, typically companies don't like to talk about that. And I also, I think, although I, I, I like the self-reflection part that data scientists should be standing up and saying, I'm the one who screwed up. Uh, and I, I generally believe that's beneficial for, for the field. But I think many people are afraid that if they would do that, then people would lose trust in machine learning and data science, so they rather stay silent on it. So I cannot really say any public examples but I have seen a few in our customer base even where there have been massive losses due to wrong models. Yeah, I imagine nobody's perfect when it comes to that. Yeah. Um, last one is how would you recommend approaching hyperparameter optimization for small data sets to avoid, to avoid overfitting? I think it's pretty much an impossible problem. If you have like 100 records, I mean, what can you do? Um, obviously, the best advice would be just collect more data and you have better trust in, in your models afterwards. But uh, yeah, I guess you cannot do that. So you, uh, what I would recommend is do not go crazy about those parameter optimizations because it's really tuning those parameters a slight bit typically won't help that much. So it's not really the parameters which are driving much of the results in data science and machine learning. Maybe in some spaces, extra 1% or extra half percent counts, but in many spaces it, it doesn't. So just make sure it's sensible what you did and uh, maybe you do not need to go deep into parameter optimization because there, the additional benefits are so small that it's, it's not worth the, the potential trouble you may get into. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sultan. I think this was a great presentation and really appreciate your coming to uh, Crunch and talking to us. Thank you.